Thanks be to God. Um, we enter this moment, um, your second um, Sunday in the series, um, in the book of, as one uh, preacher I heard say, call it Habakkuk. Um, but however his name is pronounced, it's a beautiful book, and I want you to recognize at the onset that this whole book is written because of one man's conversation with God. It's not a lot of stuff he's doing. He's somewhere pondering, meditating, spending time with the Lord, um, and there's a dialogue between God and man. I'm going to set that before us, even before I move forward, as one person can make a big difference. Your prayers, your personal time with the Lord it may seem small and insignificant in the grand scheme, but this brother made it in the Bible. He stepped out of temple ministry into prophetic ministry just by having a conversation with the Lord. I already feel like preaching right there, <laughs> right there. One, one of us can make a difference. Before I get into the word, I did want to share a song as we're talking about this is our song. This is our testimony. Um, I wanted to set an attitude for today. Uh, my title for the message today is uh, Trusting God in Troubling Times. Um, and the song I want to share is called Bless the Lord. It comes from Psalm 34 when David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be. Now, that's a hard thing to do. It's a good statement. It'll preach good, it'll make you say amen. But I've had some times where the praise went out of my mouth when life hit me. But it is the desire, it is the fight, it is even the prayer. So maybe hear the song even less as a braggadocious statement, but as a prayer that God will let me continue to bless him even when the times get hard. Let's go ahead and run that, please. Okay. I'll take a little more music if you don't mind. Say, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Let the rapper praise him for a minute. Father, we thank you for this few minutes. May you let this song, the lyrics in this song, move past the gift and the art form and minister to your people. You bless the Lord at all times. May his praise stay in my mouth. Hey, when I was down and out, man, he brought me out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hey, come on and bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that's within me. I said, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. I'm going to go wherever he sent me. I said, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that's within me. I said, bless the Lord. Yep. Oh, my soul. And I'm going to go wherever he sent me. To speak well of it amidst the mess. That's what it means to bless. That's the context of the tech. Use it, praise over stress. I confess I had some issues that need to be dealt with. Some conversations. Some more, need some help when I felt it. When my financial life hit the bottom. Trials and tribulations. May everybody got him watch him that's what the spirit said to me eyes on jesus because can't nobody do me like he do me praise flow still me privilege not a duty man i worship in the beauty of holiness Hey, holiness i'm giving thanks to the king because he's the one that showed me it's not by might nor by power it's only by spirit that's why i need him every hour he's a strong tower we need his protection he be the blessing just running his direction christ only protection between man sin and god's grace the only way we gonna overcome the struggles that we all face bless the lord at all times may his praise stay anybody had some hard times before <laughs> but god showed up to your rescue but by, hey, come on and bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. I said, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and I'ma go wherever he said me. Yeah, bless the Lord. David made up in his mind, no matter what come, what go, he was gonna continue to let God be praised in the midst of it all. Let me close it out. Hey, through many dangers, tools and the snares. We done made it through, man, cause the Lord, he's been there. Cast all your cares, yep, on he who cares for us. When me and my family was going through, he did not ignore us, ensured us that his presence would never leave us, that he would gotta lead us. That's all because of Jesus, believe us. Yep, a saint is still a sinner who falls down, but gets back up cause the blood makes us winners. Defend us of the hurt and the press. Tell him where we come and rest. It's all in the test, cause it's flesh. Yep, the sin sting is lethal, but he came to save his people he gonna meet us in the sequel free throw with no time on the clock jesus hit the shot sent your boy to the block and we can't stop because this world can't afford to live and die without hearing about the grace of the lord come on and bless the lord at all times may us praise 
Hey, when I was down and out, he brought me out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on and bless the Lord. Somebody get the Lord a hand praise. When I was down and out, he brought me out. He doesn't save us always from things, but he walks with us through things. Trials and tribulations have a purpose. It's to teach us, listen to this, about who he is. When you think about the scripture that says all things work together for our good. He doesn't exclude the bad things that happen. And think about it. If, if the bad things that come into our life, the challenging moments, the trying moments that come into our lives, first of all, we have to recognize they have God's permission. We're not talking about somebody who's sitting up there scratching his head trying to figure out what's going on. But he, as that last verse said, the Lord is in his temple. He's sitting on the throne. He running stuff, even though it looks like it's chaos, from God's vantage point, it's organized chaos. He has everything in control. He sees every detail. And if he lets it come into our lives, it has permission. And those things are one to humble us and teach us you ain't who you thought you are. You can't get away from what you thought you could get. It'll come after you too. But at the same time, he said, now look away from yourself and look at me. In the midst of your struggle, I still am who I am. I still can do what I can do. And so it's to set our eyes back on him. I believe that's where we find Habakkuk. Um, I had a chance to listen to last week's message. And first of all, I was uh, blown away because when I went to the OCC uh, site for the videos, I started seeing the times of the sermons. I'm like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> 20 minutes, 17 minutes, 22 minutes. I'm like, I'm in trouble when I get there. <laughs> So bear with me. I'm going to speed on, but bear with me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 but but I, I heard last week's message um, in terms of chapter one. And this book, again, starts out with one man's conversation with God. He begins with that complaint. How long, oh, Lord? How long are you going to, like, let this happen? I know you up there. I know you're on your throne. I know you're watching. Like, you don't see this? And then God responds. And I want you to notice what he saw. He didn't first just see the trouble of the world, what people out there were doing. He was saying, God, your people. This is people who know you. This is my cousin. This is my, this is my people. Like, this is us who know the heritage, know the legacy of your name. We know the storyline. But we tripping. So Habakkuk's ministry was during that window of Josiah after Josiah had a great reform. So Josiah is known for being a king at eight years old, and the Bible says he was a good king. And what happened during his reign is they were cleaning up the temple one day, and they fooled around and found the Bible in there. <laughs> they had been living all that time, listen, without God's word, without God's instruction. He said, man, bring that book out and it start being read before the people and a revival swept through the land. But at this moment in Habakkuk's time, that revival began to wear off. It's sort of like, you know, New Year's resolutions. <laughs> we start strong. <laughs> but by February, somebody got to remind us what we see. And here is what Habakkuk is seeing. Like, your people, we have drifted away from the things that are central and paramount. And God's response to his first complaint was, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. I'm going to raise up that army, you know, the ones that have been running around taking everybody captive. They're going to come get y'all. And he like, that don't make sense, Lord. <laughs> we your people, they not. Why would you use them to correct us? And, and you know, God's ways are not our ways. And we have to recognize, first of all, everything and every person belongs to the Lord. <laughs> Everyone is an instrument in his hands. He said, I create light and dark. Good and evil come from my hand. That's the God we're talking about. I know we categorize him as homogenized in certain category. He don't do this. He said, man, everything is mine. 
I'm not tempted by evil, none of that stuff, but everything is under my domain and reign. And so he is finna, he's saying to them, I'm going to allow this to happen. Listen, to you. The thing you wish never would happen. I mean, I believe God, in order to show us more of who he is, he has to let life and all of its complexities, all of its ups and downs, its goods and bads come our way so we can never find our equilibrium in life. You can never find your steadiness in what's going on in your life, in your world, in your career, in your business, in your family. He got to let life happen to every one of us so that we never trust in our circumstances, but we trust in the God who's bigger than our circumstances. We got to be brought to that. We don't learn that lesson easy because, listen, I'm like everybody else. I want easy street. <laughs> I don't want problems or challenges. Nobody prays for challenges. But God says, I have to use them or else you won't see me the way I want you to see me. Just think about it. Children of Israel being brought out of Egypt. That moment, that deliverance was prophesied over 400 some years ago. God tells Abraham, listen, that seed I'm going to bless you with, they're going to be captive in another land. And they're going to be going through it. He said, and it's going to be after the sin of the Amorites, then I'm going to come and deliver them. I said it to you here before, like, God, why would you wait so long? 400 years. But God is intentional. He says, I'm waiting for something to reach its climax before I move. Because remember, this is not just our story. This is his story. <laughs> He's creating a picture, an image of himself and who he is throughout all of history. And so with God, we have to take the long game. He's not just coming to fix everything in our time, though we're supposed to fight for it. Justice, racism, all of the different things, the systems of oppression, all of we got to keep fighting as the church supposed to be. I believe last week, Reverend Ward was saying, like, the people who are just, we got to stand up for justice. But we recognize we're, we're only going to get glimpses of it. We're going to get moments of it. He said, but that's not going to come until the kingdom comes. When the new kingdom comes, then it's going to be a place of real peace, real joy, real unity. But until then, I want you to live in it amongst yourselves and share it and broadcast it in the world that it's possible in Christ. And so here is where Habakkuk is. He's heard back from God that, that nation he thought would never be used by God is going to be used by God for his sovereign purposes. And I love his movement because what he has to teach, and I believe I want to say three things to us today, is he's teaching us how to wait on the Lord. We can't rush God. And God, like, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> he's a disobedient God when you start telling him what to do. He's going to do it his way. So he is saying, I'm going to do something to position myself to wait on the Lord and see what he's going to say. Listen to what the passage does. The passage says in verse 1, and I want to focus on 1 through 4 for a second. Habakkuk says, I will take my stand at my watch post, and I will station myself on the tower, and I will look out and see, or look out to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. I will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So, so the first thing you see is that there's an act of the will being made. Even though he's perplexed, he's confused, he doesn't understand God at that moment. How many of us recognize we ain't going to ever fully just understand God? If we can figure him out, then he can't be God. <laughs> if our minds can understand his infinite mind and his infinite being, then listen to this. We, we, he's not who we think he is. He has reduced himself too far. If we can figure him out, his every move, how he should move in this way, he gives us an understanding of who he is. He wants us to grow in that knowledge, but we'll never have him contained. He's bigger than we can contain him. He said, your ways, not my ways. Your thoughts, 
not my thoughts. Because, you know, I had plans for my journey. And I even had plans on how God should make my journey, like, come to pass. Like, I heard what he told me he wanted to use me for in life. And if he would have told me the route I had to take to get to become who I was supposed to become, I don't know if I would have took the journey. Because it's just like, it's just stuff he took me through that, like, that didn't make sense in the beginning. But it began to make sense later on. That's why we got to play the long game. So the conversation is about trusting God, listen to this, in troubling times, in perplexing times, in difficult times. And so he says, I'm going to set myself on my watch. You know what he said? I'm going to get on my post. I'm going to go do what the Lord told me to do. I can't figure him out right now, and I don't know what the next thing is, but I'm going to do the last thing he told me. I'm going to get on my post. And remember what the watchman is. The watchman is somebody who stands up on the gates and he's watching out for the threats of the enemies, the incoming of friends. He's watching over the gates of the city. He says, I'm going to stand over and overlook my city. You know, that's a posture of prayer. But this idea of, of waiting on the Lord, it requires patience. And patience requires trust. Um, I use this example often. Um, if I ask somebody to come pick me up because I need a ride, um, and they're late, said 9 o'clock, it's, it's 9.15. What my mind normally goes to is, who is this person that I asked to come pick me up? If they're a person that's kind of wishy-washy and all that, I'm on the phone asking somebody else to come pick me up. <laughs> but if they're a person that I believe is kind of trustworthy, I'll hang on in there because I know they're coming. Come. It's, it's, faith has this idea of expectation. It, it's this idea of I'm resting in what God has said. Um, the word expectation um, in the Greek talks about this, to have an outstretched neck. Um, the way I said it before was uh, I remember catching a bus when I was younger. And, uh, you know, the bus was supposed to come at a certain time. And when it wasn't there at that time, what we would do is move off the sidewalk and step into the street and do this. In that moment, I'm not complaining about the lateness of the bus. I'm just expecting it to come, and so I step out. Sometimes that's what God wants. So he said, let me see if you stretch your neck out. <laughs> I know you're complaining right now because it's not going how you think it is. The thing is not on schedule according to your plan, but are you still believing I'm going to do it? Do you still believe I'm going to show up? So he says, I'm going to set myself up on my watch. And he says, I'm going to get myself on the tower and look out and see what he will say to me and what I will answer him concerning my complaint. When I think about patience, listen to how Job talked about patience. Job 23, 8 through 10, if you could put that slide up so they can read with me but it, listen to what it says it says behold I go forward but he is not there and backward but I do not perceive him on the left hand when he is working I do not behold him he turns to the right hand but I do not see him so he basically said I don't know what God doing <laughs> I'm looking for it when I go over here he ain't over there when I go back over there he didn't move somewhere else he said I can't figure him out right now but look at what he says but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come out as pure gold. That's both a statement of trust and it's a statement of humility. One thing he's saying is, even though I don't know where he is, he knows where I am. <laughs> when you're in your struggle and it feel like God not paying attention, God has forgotten about me, he ain't been listening to my prayers, this is this. God knows right where you are. And he's waiting and allowing time to manifest because the Bible tells us let patience have its perfect work. Like let it keep working on you so that you'll learn to be complete or what the Bible means is that you'll grow up in maturity. Babies can't wait for nothing. <laughs> they want their way right now. <laughs> but we have to learn how to wait. Listen to this. And I believe this waiting is a waiting with strength, not waiting, flipping out, waiting with panic and worry and anxiety, but waiting in confidence, knowing that though I'm waiting, I know God is still working. 
because he has a long range view he's working on. He hasn't forgotten his promises. He said, though it tarry, wait for it, it shall not lie. What I said will come to pass. So Job says, I had to learn how to wait. And you remember his life was in upheaval. He was in the midst of going through it. He didn't know what was happening. Did I do something wrong? Did they do? He didn't know what God was doing. He didn't know the behind the scenes. But he still had a level of trust. And he said, but he knows where I am. And when he finished, whatever this process is, listen, it's not that he's doing on them, but this process he's doing in me. When he finishes this process, I'll take another degree of maturity and begin to look like what he wants me to look like. Do you not know the goal of God in life is not just for us to go to heaven? The goal of God, the scripture says, is to transform us into the image of Christ. <laughs> Even though Christ was down here in this world, listen, he was never uncertain. He was going through troubling times, but he knew his father was on the throne. Even when it was happening, listen to this, not to them, but to him. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. He had a level of clarity that had his confidence, and he was able, listen, while he was going through it, to wait on the Lord. The next thing that Habakkuk does, not only does he say, I'm going to wait and be patient, but he says, I'm going to, listen to this, I'm going to set myself on the tower and look out and see what he will say. So this is the idea of not just standing on my post, but I'm going to climb up and get a new vantage point. I'm going to look at the same set of circumstances from a new place. I'm going to get a little higher. Remember the psalmist said, set me on a rock <laughs> that's higher than me. I'm going through some challenges. I feel like I'm about to be drowned out right now. <laughs> But he said, Lord, set me on a rock. And he's talking about set me on Jesus right quick. Did you hear the words in the song, the first song our brother sung? The, the sad, he said, blessed assurance, not everything is perfect. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. <laughs> this rock's still high. <laughs> I can still get on this rock and get above my circumstances if I can just get to the tower. He said, I'm going to climb into the tower. And I'm going to wait on the Lord. The tower is a place of renewed perspective. Listen to this scripture in Romans chapter 8. I'm going to add 16, but you'll see 17 and 18. 16 says, the spirit himself thus testified together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. And if we are his children, then we are his, his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. Only we must share his suffering if we are to share his glory. So we got to go through it to get to it. He said, but what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life, are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. That's a lot of gifts coming our way. In us, to us, on us. He said, what I'm going through right now is not worthy to be compared to what God going to give me later on. <laughs> oh, we got to take the long range view. God is still working. Listen to this. He has already triumphed. Listen, it's not over Babylon. Babylon ain't the real enemy. <laughs> the real enemy is sin. <laughs> I mean, Babylon can hurt. He said, don't worry about the one that can kill the body, but worry about the one that can kill the body and throw the soul into hell. <laughs> He said, so there's bigger things than what can confront your life in this momentary time. He said, there's something bigger. And he said that I reckon. He said, I consider. That's a calculation. You have to take yourself to that place. You could look at your problems and let your problems talk to you. Or you could look at your problems and talk back. <laughs> and say, even though I'm going through this, it's not a denial. It's not delusional. This is really happening in my life. And I can't stop it. I can't make God speed up and get me out of it. So what he says I'm going to do is take myself somewhere else. I'm going to reckon that even this that I'm going through in the present moment is nowhere near close to what God has for me later on. So it creates this moment of endurance. I remember a story about a brother who story went like, he got an inheritance. Somebody left him an inheritance. 
And in order for him to get the inheritance, he had to get from, just say, California to New York. And he said, I'm going to go out here so I can sign the papers, get the inheritance. And um, he's driving in his car to get there. At this moment, he's broke. He ain't got nothing. But on his way driving from California to New York, he break down somewhere in Utah. And he's just on the road, on the side of the road, crying. But it's almost like, man, if you don't get out that car, start walking, hitchhike, go to the bus station, ask somebody to borrow a few, if you don't, like, move on past the moment. Because there's something waiting on you. Something that's been signed, sealed, and delivered. And so God encourages us to press on and keep on going. So he gets a new vantage point. He had to personally consider and reckon in his mind. You know, reckon is how you do accounts. Minus and pluses. He started putting it all together. And he looked at it and like, oh, I'm all right. <laughs> I'm in good shape. <laughs> when I do my balance, that was looking heavy over here because I just kept looking at that. But I got some stuff over here that balanced that thing out. Actually, I'm in the positive over here. It's good. So I can keep on pressing. Another thing that is about perspective is how we handle these challenges. Think about this scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11 in the Amplified. Look at what Paul said. He said, we are pressed in every way. We're hedged in, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed. We're unsure of finding a way out, but we're not driven to despair. We're hunted down and persecuted, but not deserted to stand alone. Struck down, but never destroyed. Always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus so that the resurrection life of Jesus also may be shown in our body. For we who live are constantly experiencing the threat of being handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that the resurrection life of Jesus also may be evidenced in our mortal body, which is subject to death. So let me make that plan. Apostle Paul used to go to a place and preach in a certain city. And there'll be moments he'll go to that city and they'll whoop him up out of the city. <laughs> like literally a grown man, like get up out of here. We don't want to hear that. They'll run him out of the city. This cat would dust himself off, get back up and say, I'm headed to the next city there. <laughs> Listen, that's a different kind of life on the inside of you. You get that done to you enough times, you're going to stop talking. But what he said, the life of Jesus is being manifested in me because I recognize the Savior gave up his life to get this message to me. And so what I'm going to do now is remember the goal of life, to be transformed into the image of Christ. Now I want to take that mantle. And I want to walk in Jesus' steps. And listen to this, the church's role, finish the mission. I want to continue to go. So he had to listen to this, get his mind in the right place. I'm really being struck down. I'm really being persecuted. I'm really going through it, but he kept putting another word on top of that. He didn't let those words stay on top of him. He said, I'm struck down, but I ain't destroyed. <laughs> he said, I'm down, but I ain't out. <laughs> they trying to stop me, but he keep pushing me forward. He continued to keep a Christ-centered view, even though he was going through trouble. I believe this is part of what began to give folks like Harriet Tubman a tenacity to press on through the darkness, to be like, no, we, 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 some of us going to touch that freedom. <laughs> we going to press on through this. Or else some, you just give up. It seems hopeless. Listen to what that one pastor says. He said, we are perplexed. We're unsure of finding a way out, but we are not driven to despair. <laughs> despair is I give up. <laughs> Forget it. It was a continual fight. And so the fight is to fight to get to what God has for us. And in this last piece, you heard God say to him, he said, and the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For the still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to its end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And then he goes into a new conversation. Behold, his soul is puffed up. He's talking about the king of Babylon. He's talking about the one he's going to use. He's going to give authority over his people. He's saying, but he puffed up. He think he's going to do it. 
Even though he don't know, he don't surrender to me, he's not going to bow down to me. But I want to keep you in your right posture. Forget about him. But those who are right with me, going to trust me. Trust you when you finna let that happen. Trusting a God who allowed evil to happen. You didn't stop this. You didn't prevent this. God said, my first goal in your life is not your comfort. My first goal in your life is your confidence in me. He has to be brought to this place because he recognized he started the conversation saying, God, we the one messing up in your presence, your people. It's not just evil out there. It's evil right here. So he recognized and acknowledges we have sinned. And God says, this is how I'm going to remedy the sin problem. I'm going to give the people a bigger problem. And what is that problem going to do? Make them call on me. <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they come over here and, ready and get after them, they going to call my name for real then. You know, sometimes you don't pray for real until you get in trouble. <laughs> Sometimes the prayers be right. The words be flowery. Sometimes you don't need all them words. Just get right to the point with God. Lord, I need you. He said, I'm waiting to hear that sound. Not how many words, not the flowery. I want to hear your heart. Say, I can't make it without you. So I give you circumstances under my permission and purpose so that you could be brought to a place to look to me with real trust. This last part of it is not only is he waiting with patience, not only did he get a new vantage point, but I believe God begins to point in this passage to him. He begins to point him to Christ. He says, the righteous shall live by faith. They'll live by trusting me. And God's work to get us right is not something we do just by transforming ourselves, stopping this, starting that. To get right with God, we believe in Christ. He's the remedy. To not the Babylonian problem that's out there, to the sin problem that's in here. I'm, they not just God's enemy, I'm God's enemy. Until I bow the knee to Christ. Think about this scripture then in Romans 3, 19 through 24. It says, now we know that whatever the law of Moses says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that the excuses of every mouth may be silenced from protesting and that all the world may be held accountable to God and subject to his judgment. For no person will be justified, freed of guilt and declared righteous in his sight by trying to do the works of the law. For through the law, we become conscious of sin and the recognition of sin directs us towards repentance, but provides no remedy for sin. But now, the righteousness of God or the way to get right with God has been clearly revealed independently and completely apart from the law, though it is actually confirmed by the law and the words and writings of the prophets. He says in 22, this righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those Jews or Gentiles who believe and trust in him and acknowledge him as God's son. There is no distinction. Since all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God and are being justified, declared free of the guilt of sin, made acceptable to God and granted eternal life as a gift by his precious undeserved grace through the redemption, the payment for our sin, which is provided in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul on numerous occasions quotes this Habakkuk passage that the just or the righteous shall live by their faith. Not faith in itself as the act of faith of trusting God, but faith in the person. Faith in the person of Christ who did the work that lets us, listen to this, be able to trust God. Because God's way of getting even was not just to come and punish people who did wrong. See, that's what Habakkuk was like. Why are you going to let them get fix us? Like, <laughs> You go use evil people. No, God said, listen, let me show you. I got a long range. He said earlier in that passage in chapter one, I'm doing the work that if I told you, you wouldn't even believe me. The way I'm finna make this thing go down so that you could see my justice, I still don't play with sin. I don't tolerate evil. I, I'm going to deal with that. But he said, before I turn my weapons on them, God says, I'm going to show you my love by turning my weapons on myself. The God who's willing to suffer 
the consequences, not just for his people, but he said, listen, I got, I got some people that's over in Babylon. They belong to me. <laughs> I'm going to save some of them too. It's going to be a surprising thing. Some of the things we, or people we want God to get on, we want to sit God on them. God said, no, I'm going to save him. <laughs> He's going to be your brother. That's going to be your sister. You mad at him right now. <laughs> but my work extends beyond your mere moments of getting even, getting justice for yourself. God said, this ain't about you. It's about me. It's about me showing my love, me extending the borders of my kingdom. And he said, I have some people included that you want to reject or get rid of, but I'm opening my door. And so he says, I'm going to take the first blow on myself. And so then Habakkuk begins to get the clarity. God says, in time, I'm going to deal with the Babylonians. That's what verses 5 through 20 was about. That's why I wanted it read. He said, I, I'm going to deal with it. I see it. But that's not my main priority. My main priority is that though you are perplexed, though you are troubled, though you are unsure about what's going on out there, that verse says, but I'm on my throne in my temple. <laughs> and there's no unclarity, says God, on my side. I know exactly what I'm doing. May he bring us to trust that even when we can't see our way through it, we believe our way. Father, we do thank you. Thank you for this, this message, this conversation you let us eavesdrop on with Habakkuk. This, this man who looked at his world and saw trouble both in the church and in the streets. And he had his conclusions of how to remedy that. But may all of us drop our opinions, end our complaints, and, and remember that you know the end from the beginning. You're not unsure, you're not wavering, you're not frantic or panicking. Things are going according to your plan. Things are going according to your will. You're letting sin rise even in the earth around us that unsettles us it makes us nervous it makes us um, concerned and it should but we recognize that in this life we're not going to ever have ultimate peace there's never going to be ultimate security here you never promised us that you said our security and our peace will be found in him trouble gonna happen but you said but keep your mind stayed on me and i'll keep you in perfect peace would you teach us how to wage war effectively so that internally our hearts can be settled, even as we fight the fight of justice, even as we move to where Habakkuk is going to go. He began this whole book out wondering and worrying. We find him here in chapter 2. He's waiting and he's watching. Chapter 3 moves forward as they get to it in the next several weeks. We'll see him worshiping and witnessing. Nothing changed out there in the landscape. It was still crazy out there. But something changed in him. He got a renewed perspective on your faithfulness, on you who makes promises and will keep those promises, which let him go out and not try to fight things off. But he began to raise the banner of worship to get eyes back on you. He began to witness to people about the vision and the revelation so that their hearts can be brought to be settled and have peace, even in troubling times. May you make us like Habakkuk. May you turn our complaints into confidence where we have a conviction to share your message with this world. For this is how you're going to win the war. It's by pointing people to Jesus who already has given us the victory. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray and let us all say amen and thank God. God bless you, Oakland City Church.